Our New Testament reading for this morning comes from the 22nd chapter of the book of Matthew, verses 34 through 40. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, be with us this day. May what we hear be your word, and what we do be your word in action, now and always. Amen. We are in the middle of that time of year when we are focusing on stewardship. I know that's true because I listened to Mark, who gave a great announcement for stewardship and what it means to give to God. And we have begun a three-part sermon series on being good stewards for God. Two weeks ago, we learned the following. Stewardship should never be about how much you are going to pledge to the church for the coming year. Stewardship should always be about how does the way I live my life and serve my church, how is that a praiseful and thankful response to all that God has given me? This year's stewardship theme is Gifts in Action. And for this sermon series, we are looking at a quote from Leo Lascagula. And the quote is, your talent is God's gift to you. What you do with it is your gift back to God. Our previous sermon focused on how we use our God-given gifts to do our best for God every single day. Today, we want to use those gifts that God gives us to help us to love other people. In our scripture passage, Jesus is approached by a Pharisee and asked, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. The Pharisee was actually testing Jesus, and he was looking for the exact answer that Jesus gave, which was a quote from Deuteronomy 6.5. This verse was extremely important. It was the first verse that every Jewish child memorized, and it was something near and dear to the heart of what people believed that God should come first, that we should love God with a total commitment. Now, when I was a boy, my Sunday school teacher made me memorize the Ten Commandments. Odd enough, not my father, who was the minister, but the Sunday school teacher. They're the ones with all the power, right? <laughs> and I hated doing it. It wasn't the memorization bit that bothered me. It was the added work of putting all those commandments in the correct order. I tried and tried just to list them, but every time I went out of order, I would be stopped and told that it's crucial to our faith to put the Ten Commandments and to know them in the proper order, the way they're listed in the Bible. Reciting the Ten Commandments and in the correct order confirms what Jesus said to the Pharisee in our text for today. God comes first in our lives. Our first commandment is you shall have no other gods before me. This commandment is first for a reason. God needs to be that important to what we do in this world. In fact, commandments one through four teach us all about how we should be treating God. Have no other gods before me. Do not make graven images. Do not use the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Commandments five through 10 Deal with how we should be treating other people, honoring our father and mother. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not lie, do not covet. And did you notice I got them all in the correct 
order. When Jesus was asked, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Jesus was in effect saying, look, you're, you're a Pharisee. You know the Ten Commandments better than most. It's all right here. If you put God first in your life and you love people second, all the other commandments will fall into place. Obey those two and naturally you will be obeying all the others. So how do we use our gifts to love others? We love others when God comes first in our lives. Now, what does that look like? How do we absolutely, wholeheartedly, and without question, put God first? Some would say that to put God first means to pray often throughout the day, foremost in the morning, in the car on the way to our first destination, pray at our jobs before we begin work, before each meal, on the drive home, and of course, right before going to bed. Some would say that to put God first means to pour over Scripture, which would include reading from the Bible every morning, every evening before we're going to bed, joining a weekly Bible study, and attending Sunday school on every Sunday morning. Some would say that to put God first means to live an overt Christian life. Attend church every Sunday, join Christian organizations, help the homeless and the poor and the destitute, send money to missions both locally and around the world, witness to others about Jesus, live out your faith by example. So are all of these things required to love God with all of our heart, mind and soul? Is it none of these things because God's grace in Christ is all that we need? Or are these things like a Chinese menu and we get to pick some from column A and some from column B and one or two from column C? Well, let me see if I can answer that with a story. There was a boy named Bobby and Bobby liked the way he looked in his football picture. The team photographer had posed him in the traditional action stance which made him look big and tough and strong and mean and he liked the way he looked in the picture so much so he had an enlargement made and he gave it to his parents they immediately framed the photo and they hung it on the wall and one day Bobby came home and he noticed that the picture was hanging crooked so he pushed up the side that was hanging low and he stood back and he decided it was straight and he decided that he looked really good in that picture <coughs> The next day he came home and he noticed that the picture was crooked again. And so he thought to himself, well maybe I didn't do it right. So once again he pushed up the low side, he looked at the picture, he stepped back, he decided it was straight, and he couldn't help but thinking how good he looked in that picture. The next day he came home and the picture was crooked again. And he says, hey, who keeps messing up my picture? I'm sure it was straight. Once again, he straightened the picture, and once again, he noticed how good he looked in that picture. And he wondered if it would be crooked tomorrow. And sure enough, when he came home the next day, it was crooked. Well, he stared at this picture for a moment, and then he had an idea. On the back of the frame was that horizontal wire that caught the, the hook that was in the wall. And he thought, maybe the wire isn't centered on the hook. So that's what he did. He worked and he looked until the wire was centered on the hook that was centered on the wall. And when he let go, the picture hung straight. The next day he came home and the picture was hanging perfectly straight. And it's been that way ever since. And he's still sure that he looks good in that picture. A picture frame will stay level only if it's centered on the hook. If it's not, any attempt to correct the problem will only be temporary. If it's not centered on the hook, gravity will always pull the picture out of whack. And it's the same with us. Unless we make Christ the center of our lives, we will eventually be pulled out of whack. We can try again and again to straighten ourselves out, but we will end up right back where we started. In order for us to be straight, 
we must find our center in God. Each one of us will have to decide for ourselves how and when and how much we pray and study and serve God in our lives. That is a question we need to answer in our own personal relationship with Christ. However, to love God with our heart, with our mind, and with our soul, it is to allow God to be the fixed center of who we are, to let Christ dictate how we should be living. So when God comes first, what matters, what is important to us, is a life that pleases, a life that thanks, a life that praises God, who God is, and what God has given when we are living out our faith in that way, our focus is on helping and forgiving and reaching out and loving all those who are our neighbors. Now, I read something in one of my books. It's the Applied New Testament Commentary. And um, it's not really a quote. It's more what I got out of the text. But, but this is what the book says. I think this command from Jesus would fit into our lives better, would be easier to follow if Jesus had said, love your neighbor after you have taken care of your own needs. Love yourself and your neighbor equally. Love your neighbor if that neighbor is worthy of your love. It is a natural thing to love and take care of our own needs first. And Jesus wants us to love our neighbor as if that person was ourselves. Well, my immediate question would be why? I mean, if we're good and kind, if we are gentle and compassionate, if we love God, if we serve God with our lives, if our faith journey calls us to help and work and love God's people, why do we have to do that with the same love that we show to our own selves and to our own needs. When we use our gifts by loving others, we are putting God first. When we love others, we become selfless. When we love others, we live out God's purpose. When we love others, we are doing what Christ commanded. When we love others, we love as Jesus first loved us. When we love others, we demonstrate to God our praiseful and thankful response to what God gives us. It seems like it's time for a story. So I'm going to come out because the microphone's not working. So this is a story about a man named John Blanchford. And he is sitting on a park bench outside of downtown Grand Central Station. And he's dressed in his military uniform. He looks good. And he's about ready to do the most nervous, nerve-wracking thing that he's ever faced in his life. And this goes back to three years earlier. He's in town, and he goes into one of those used bookstores, and he's looking for a book. And the title of a book grabs his attention. And he takes it home and he reads the book and this book changes his life. Not because it's a good book, it's a terrible book, he didn't like it. But in the pages of the book, in the margin of the book, was the previous owner's thoughts and feelings. And he became captivated with what this person had to say. Even the handwriting was beautiful and poetic and impressive. And is, as it would happen, in the back of the book was the person's name and address. So John Blanchford took a big deep breath and he wrote to this person and told her how much he had admired and enjoyed what she had to say. For him, he saw a good and decent person who would love and take care of other people and that was a person he wanted to get to know. So they began writing to each other. And they only got about one letter out each when John Blanchard was, trend, was called up to go and serve his country during World War II, so he left. And that started a three-year letter writing campaign between the two of them, between John Blanchard and this Mary Ann Hollis who had written the, in the notes of a book he had bought at a store. 
And for the next three years, they wrote and they became friends and they got to know about each other's lives and they got to know personal things about each other. And as would happen during this time and in a time of war, they fell in love with each other. And now here it is three years later and he is sitting on a park bench because he is now home from the war and they've decided to meet. In the last letter, Mary Ann Hollis wrote and she said, I think it's time that we meet one another. Meet me at five o'clock in the middle of Grand Central Station. Bring the book with you and you'll know me because I'll be wearing a red rose in my lapel. So it's just about five o'clock, he gets up from the park bench and he walks over and he stands in the middle of Grand Central Station honing in on anyone wearing a red rose in their lapel. And he sees coming towards him, wearing a, a nice green business suit, the most amazing woman he's ever seen in his life. And she's walking closer to him and he can see her, her long, dark, brunette hair. He can see that she's got very kind eyes a smile, because she's smiling at him as she comes towards him, a smile that's lighting up all of Grand Central Station. She's got everything that you could ever want for, and he immediately falls in love with this woman, and it's love at first sight, and she's not wearing a rose in her lapel. And as she smiles at him and she says hello, as she as she walks away, she gives that thing that we see in all the movies. She turns around, she gives him that opportunity, that chance, that once in a lifetime moment to, to talk to her, to go after her, to, to pursue the woman that he's just head over heels in love with. And as he's making that moment, there's another lady that comes right up to him. And this lady is in her early to mid 40s. And to say that she was plump or slightly overweight would have been very kind. And she had long kind of hair that was going gray and it was up in a bun. And she had no makeup on and she didn't dress to appeal what she looked like. And she seemed very nice, but she was very plain, very unassuming and she looked very serious. And as, as you guessed it, she is wearing a red rose in her lapel. So John Blanchard has to make a decision. Does he not see the woman he's fallen in love with in the letters and pursue this other lady who's obviously giving him a chance? Or does he do the right thing, what he's supposed to do, and approach the lady wearing the red rose? It wasn't a hard decision for him because he was raised to, to treat people with respect and to love one another and it wouldn't be fair to not see through the other relationship that he had started. So he tightens up his uniform, he looks his best and he goes over and he says, good afternoon Miss Hollis, I am John Blanchard and I would love to buy you dinner. And the lady with the rose in her repel smiles at him and says, young man, I have no idea what you're doing. She said, this lady that just passed me in the green suit told me to wear this rose. And she said that if you were to ask me to dinner, I was to tell you that she's waiting for you in the restaurant across the street. She said it was some sort of a test. Would we pass that test? of loving others and respecting others and putting others' needs first and doing what's right in this world by our God to other people. Would we pass that test? John Blanchard passed that test and hopefully we can too because if we put God first with all our heart, mind and soul and we put others next and we put ourselves last, we will pass any test that life throws our way. Let us pray. Gracious God, be with us this and each day. Give us the courage to do what we know is right, now and always. Amen.